Why does it hurt so much? We're going to answer that. My name is Dr. Paul Zalzal. I'm Dr. Brad Winnie. Dr. Danny Aurora, nice to have me. Welcome. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Welcome to Talking with Docs, uh, where we talk with docs to develop a patent and way. Wait, no, not patents. To it's mix not, humor and medicine. We've copyrighted a way to mix nope, humor nope. and Our medicine. Our lawyer said it's not copyrighted either. Okay, on the back of a napkin, we wrote this idea down to write sort of uh, medical humor mixed in with medical information. That's what we're going to do. Plantar fasciitis. What's the plantar fascia? Yeah, good question. So uh, plantar fascia is essentially a thick uh, fascial band or, or a thick band on the bottom and the sole of the foot. Everyone has it. You have two feet, so you have two plantar fasciitis. Okay, so in plantar fasciitis, that is inflammation of that plantar fascia. Exactly. And what is that characterized by? Yeah, so a lot of times it's pain on the bottom of the heel. A lot of times the classic symptoms are, you know, first steps coming out of the bed. People stay, they step down, they can't even walk, they're crawling to the bathroom. Um, sometimes it can happen after sitting for long periods of time, if you're driving right. uh, and getting out of the car, if you're at the office and you're on the computer or at the desk a lot and you get up, sometimes that can, that can be the, the classic presentation of symptoms. It can sometimes happen after activity, prolonged activity, and that could exacerbate the symptoms as well. Okay, who gets it? Yeah, it can happen to anybody. I don't okay. think there's necessarily... No age? A, I mean, I see a lot of times in middle age, you know, um, you know, 40 to 60 uh, age range is probably the most common presentation that I do see it, but I've seen it in younger patients as well. Yep. I've seen it in athletes as well. Um, so I think it pretty much could, you know, touch everybody. Okay, and it's a very common problem. Leave a comment if you've had it or you're thinking of getting it. It is very common and it hurts a lot and can be very debilitating because it hurts with every step you take. And, and sometimes it seems the people that I see, we don't they don't come to me for this, but they talk about it. it seems like it can nag on. Like it's not necessarily yeah. like a quick fix kind of thing. No, it can can be something that could be chronic even even for you know a few years. A lot of times it takes a few months to kind of. Uh, settle in and then also to go away. Uh, so the treatment could be sometimes lengthy. I think the biggest thing is patience and persistence and uh, perseverance with the patients to follow through with the treatment plan. Okay, so patients have to have patience for this to go away. There so let's go. talk about treating it. I mean, yeah, so a lot of times patients come and they, they say, oh, I got an x-ray and they feel like there's this bony spur on the bottom. They're like, doc, take down the spur. Um, and I tell them, that unfortunately, that's not going to treat their symptoms. Um, but I think the biggest thing is the diagnosis. Okay, so the diagnosis, how do you make that diagnosis? Yeah, so again, anytime we look at the feet, we take both feet up. Uh, you know the, the shoes and socks off have them stand look at their alignment sometimes different uh, alignments whether people are flat foot or have what's called a cavus or a high arch foot can predispose patients to have you know pain in their fascia um, okay. and then secondly would be the location of the pain and then the best probably the biggest clinical uh, sign is when patients have actually pain right underneath the I guess the medial heel where the fascia attaches to the calcaneus or the heel bone. Okay, any special tests or investigations that we do for this? Yeah, I use my thumb and I press, and <laughs> if the patient say, the Danny, Ouch. the Danny push test? Yeah, there you go. Uh, that's not patented or copyrighted <laughs> or anything like that. I guess it should be. Okay, right. so you do the push test, you, um, do, the, you do an x-ray. Not Sometimes I would say uh, the x-ray would be more to make sure there's nothing, nothing else weird going, going on. on. You have yeah. to, to rule out some things. And but a lot of times family doctors have an ultrasound that come with it that says the fascia is either thickened, partial tears, inflamed, and mm -hmm. then they give me measurements. But at the end of the day, I think the clinical diagnosis is probably the key. Okay, so there are some investigations that you may have had done for your plantar fasciitis, but they're not necessary to make the diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis. Yeah, so again, pushing right at the fascia and the patient scream they have pain. And then they would say, yes, this is the pain. I think that's the biggest question. Is this the pain that they're having, whether it be you know, coming out of the first steps out of bed or after a long sitting period? Uh, essentially, you wanna reproduce the patient's symptoms. All right, so that's the diagnosis. Let's jump into treatment now. Operative, yeah. non-operative, conservative? Yeah, so I think the, the mainstay treatment is non-operative. Okay. Um, you know, my approach to plantar fasciitis is to tackle the plantar, uh, the plantar fasciitis treatment with multiple things all at once. I think that's probably the most effective. Ooh, so multimodal approach. I love there it. you go. So starting one with proper footwear, um, you know, nice comfortable shoes. Some people like to get orthotics. That could be sometimes helpful to offload the pain in the heel. Secondly, we to get an anti-inflammatory cream that you can apply locally at that area to decrease the inflammation uh, locally and to decrease some of the symptoms. Secondly, uh, sorry, thirdly would be to do a lot of stretching. Okay. You want to stretch the fascia. So essentially what's happening is the fascia gets really, really tight when you're sleeping. No one sleeps with their feet up, no. right? And I think that's the biggest thing. So their feet are down, the fascia shrinks down. 
and then when they get out of the bed or after a long sitting period, right. that's where you stretch the fascia. And if it's inflamed, that's where the symptoms come. Now you're doing exercise. Do you ever get do active release where someone else is like almost doing like a deep yeah, tissue so massage the, there? There's a lot of different things out there. I mean, if you could go, you want to see your physiotherapist, you have a massage therapist, a chiro, uh, osteopath. Essentially, you want to stretch the fascia. Yep. If there's different ways of decreasing inflammation as well, if they want to use adjunctive modalities and things like ultrasound therapy and all that stuff. But essentially, the goal is to decrease the inflammation where the, the uh, fascia attaches and also to stretch it. Another thing too what I like to recommend is cryo stretching. It's a, essentially a very easy you freeze a water bottle and you roll your foot or knead oh. your plantar fascia on a frozen water bottle so it's icing it at the same time as stretching oh. it. Okay. Some people like to get like either um, baseball lacrosse ball something small like really really hard on the on the bottom and they start stretching the plantar fascia. Okay, and what's really cool about this treatment is that you can do a lot of this on your own. And the yeah. thing about plantar fasciitis, if you Google it, the first two or three hits are gonna be sponsored ads, right? right? And whenever you have a sponsored sort of ad or a sponsored hit on YouTube, you have to watch out because there's science mixed in with marketing and the line gets blurred and you sure. can't tell what's science and what's marketing. Still go to those sites, you can, but just recognize that there's some science and some marketing and they're mixed in. Unlike here where we're just giving you the facts. So those are a lot of treatments that are easy to do, not very expensive. And do they work? Like what's the success rate typically would you Yeah. Have? So another thing for treatment, just one last thing is night splinting. Okay. Ooh. So like I alluded to before, everyone sleeps with their feet that are downwards. So the night splint premise is essentially to stretch your fascia while you're sleeping. So essentially when you get up, your foot's already stretched out. Right. Now cool. there's a lot of different night splints out there. There's some different socks and stuff like that. Uh, there's some big kind of air cast type boots. Essentially, you want to get one that's actually going to stretch your foot and not just pull your toes. Right. 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 So it has to go all the way. And Correct. When you're moving at the ankle, we don't want to move it. Correct. So there's different things out there. Obviously, uh, you want to make sure that either you get good guidance from your um, your surgeon, your foot specialist, um, okay. or your podiatrist. And this works a lot of the time. Yeah. So like I said, I, the multimodal approach, I would say for me in my hands, I've seen probably 75 to 80% of my patients tend to get some type of improvement. Yep. Okay. Um, and I think that's where I start with the majority of my patients. What kind of time frame are we talking? Because some of these people have suffered for a long time and they're like, listen, I've been doing this for a month or six weeks. Yeah. It's still not working yet. How long do you push through that before you maybe say, I need to go to the next level? So I think about two to three months, okay. depending on severity of treatment, uh, sorry, the, the severity of the symptoms. And again, depending on what stage the patient's come and see right. me, that's where we might tweak a bit the uh, treatment. Okay, let's take it up a notch. Now, these, these sort of conservative measures that are fairly inexpensive have worked in 75, 80, I've even read 90% of the time. If you're at one of the unfortunate 10 to 20% where this is not working, what are some options available? Yeah, so that, that would be my non-invasive approach that we just mm -hmm. talked about. And then we get into maybe a little bit more invasive, meaning uh, injections. Okay. Yeah. So for me, there's two injections that I'll use for this. Uh, number one being corticosteroids or a steroid injection, yep. mm -hmm. where you inject right where the fascia attaches to the, um, to the bone, right into that space to decrease the inflammation locally. Um, so that would be one more inexpensive, very commonly in most you know, successful? physicians. Yeah, it could be pretty successful. Um, and the newer thing that we're probably doing now is called PRP or platelet rich plasma. Um, more expensive, but if you look at some of the studies, there's been evidence to show that PRP has been more successful in terms of functional uh, recovery, decreased symptoms, um, and there's some uh, randomized control trials too. Okay, so you start with that. a cortisone or a corticosteroid first. If that doesn't work as an injection, you consider PRP. Yeah. And people will ask, how many times can I have an injection? How many times That's can I get a cortisone question. injection? Yeah, so for me, I just try to spread them out. I don't like doing multiple injections. Probably four to six months, you could probably do that. I have four to six Is months. there any risk? A lot of people are also gonna ask this. Well, I had an injection. I'm worried about like a rupture of some type of complication related to the cortisone. Is this something that's dangerous and could, could rupture that fascia? Yeah, so in theory, there is that always that downside of rupture. However, if you look at some of the treatments for plantar fasciitis, it might work, right? cutting or releasing it. Not that we're trying to achieve that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you've got injections, uh, either cortisone, try that first. If that doesn't work, you might have to dig into your pocketbook and get some PRP. PRP yeah. And then what about shockwave therapy? You read about yeah. shockwave therapy. So shockwave, I would say a lot of patients come to me and say, Hey, I've tried it. It kind of works. Okay. Does it work? I would say the evidence is probably loose out there. I don't necessarily recommend to doing it. However, if they want to try and do that, or if they've already had some success, then I would say you can try it. 
Now, if you're one of the few people that still hasn't got relief from the conservative and the injections, you mentioned surgical intervention. Yeah, I would say that's very rare. I can't say that I've done many surgeries for plantar fasciitis specifically. Okay. Um, some of the treatments would be either a partial release or a full release of the plantar fascia. Again, that could be done endoscopic, meaning with a camera, it could be done with a small incision. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some osteotomies where you're essentially just um, changing the uh, alignment of the calcaneus, which is the heel bone where the fascia attaches, to try to decrease the tension so you have less of that pull. Okay. So the operation is not to go in and knock off potentially a little bone spur that's there, because a lot of people would ask you for that. Say, yeah. somehow they got an x-ray and it shows this little thing and then everyone's like, listen, this is my problem. I just need this to go away and it's going to be fine. I don't, I don't see that as being the main reason. Right. I know there's some people who do claim that you know removing that plantar spur will relieve all the, the pain. Right. Uh, I just don't see it. So yeah. the, the deal with that bone spur is maybe years ago we used to think that was the cause and people just used to go in and take out that bone spur but what we've learned is a lot of people have plantar fasciitis without the bone spur and a lot of people have bone spurs on their heel and don't have plantar fasciitis so it's not related to your plantar fasciitis in the studies that we've looked at so get that out of your mind that the, I got a heel spur that's why I got plantar fasciitis and the other important message here is that surgery is very, very, very rarely required for plantar fasciitis. The vast majority of the time you can treat it with the non-operative, less conservative, or even injection that we've talked about. So most of the time it's going to go away and get treated with the, not, with the less invasive stuff. Occasionally you might need some injections and very, very, very rarely is surgery indicated in this. Correct. Am I lying or am I telling the truth about it? <laughs> I'd say you're telling the truth. All right. Yeah. Dr. Rohr pretty much gets people walking on a cloud. That's what his whole profession does. Gets <laughs> yeah. people walking again. And obviously we recognize it's gonna be very debilitating. If you start your day rolling out of bed with agony in your feet, that affects so many other aspects of your life. So definitely talk to your local practitioner about options to deal with your plantar fasciitis. Yeah, and if you're you know standing up, walking for 23 hours of the day, your feet are gonna be sore. So you're gonna to have to think of a way that you can modify your activities if you do have plantar fasciitis to give your body a chance to heal it so you feel better. There you Absolutely. go. Awesome summary. If you like this video, please like it, subscribe to our channel. And remember, you are in charge of your own health. Thank you, Dr. Aurora. Thanks for having me.